Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our last webinar of the season, all about getting outside for summer. I hope you all are enjoying some beautiful summer weather like we are here in Ithaca. This webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to view it um, either on Friday or Monday on our YouTube channel. So don't worry if you miss anything. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Most of us are probably pretty familiar with Zoom right now, but in case Zoom hasn't been your platform of choice, I just wanna go over a couple of quick things with you. First, when I went full screen, it probably went full screen for you. So I recommend that you actually exit full screen and this will allow you to dock your chat window. So the next thing you're going to want to do is find that speech bubble icon that says chat, click on that, open that to the side. And then down here, right above where you type your text, you'll either want to change to all panelists and attendees, or it might say everyone for you. And that will allow us all to chat with each other. Let's go ahead and give that chat window a try. Why don't you share where you're from and what type of educator you are? And you can share where you're where you're from too. It's always fun to see where folks are joining from. And while you all are typing, I'm going to go ahead and share with you a little bit more about the Lab of Ornithology. We are a membership driven nonprofit institution, and our mission is to interpret and conserve the Earth's biological diversity through research, education, and citizen science focused on birds. My name is Kelly Schaefer, and I am the Outreach Coordinator with the K-12 Education Team, and I am joined by Susan Liker, excuse me, Susan Licker, who is our Education Specialist. And our mission here is to create innovative resources and trainings that help educators build science skills and inspire young people to connect to local habitats, explore biodiversity, and engage in citizen science projects. Really happy to have you all here with us tonight. Um, and please feel free to continue sharing in the chat window where you're from and what your role as an educator is. And uh, let us know if you're having any issues with the chat window in the Q&A or raise your hand. Awesome, thanks so much. So I have a few different goals for tonight. I kind of wanted to do this as a smorgasbord of resources for you all. So first, we're gonna talk a little bit about the benefits of outdoor learning. Um, next, we are going to dive into just the wealth of resources that are out there for you from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And I'm gonna focus on four different things. I'm gonna focus on our, some of our free downloads, book guides and some online resources that you can pull really awesome activities from. And then we'll do a brief exploration of a couple identification apps. And I also have a couple discussion questions for you all if we have time um, that I would love to open up and, and have a conversation with you about. So benefits of outdoor education. If you have taken kids outside before, you've probably noticed some of these and maybe anecdotally, you feel like you have a pretty, you know, you've seen some pretty great effects from having kids outside. The good news is that the research bears those positive effects out. So when kids get the opportunity to learn in natural environments, 
we find uh, that they often experience better academic performance um, in all subjects, reading, writing, math, science, and social studies. It also enhances creativity and critical thinking skills. So some of those really important skills that as educators, we're trying to provide our students with the tools for success. We also see an increase in focus and attention. And along with that, other improved behaviors, including reduced aggression, more impulse control, and less disruptive behavior. So these are all really great things that help our students connect better to what they're learning about. So for example, we see increased enthusiasm for learning, which is wonderful. We want our kids to be excited. We want them to have fun while learning. Along similar lines, there are lots of health benefits associated with outdoor learning. And all of these infographics that we are looking at come from the Children in Nature Network work. And Susan just shared the link to those in the chat window. Some of the health benefits we see are associated with the increased physical activity of being outside, which includes things like reduced risk of obesity. Children are actually better, to cope, better able to cope with stress when they are outside or around other greenery. And then because they're outside having fun, exploring and being creative, we see improved relationship skills. So kids are, you know, working together in creative play and problem solving and building these awesome skills. All really wonderful aspects of social emotional well being. We also see that spending time in nature helps create nature champions. So when kids have time to learn outside, they have good experiences in nature, it helps them exhibit care towards nature, build that connection that makes them good stewards. So all of these benefits of time in nature help our kids be more well-rounded, help them deal with stress and their emotions better. I know that a lot of us during the pandemic turn to outdoor exploration in the warm months to help reduce some stress. And we saw at the Lab of Ornithology a huge increase in folks discovering birds, which was really wonderful. But why birds? Well, for one thing, birds are everywhere. Wherever you are, you can hear them singing, you can observe them flying around and you know being colorful and wonderful. So birds are accessible to everyone, which makes them a really great tool for us as educators, because we have the ability to spark curiosity about a creature that kids can observe anywhere every day. So an opportunity to build lifelong curiosity. Plus, this time of year, birds are just doing really cool stuff. They're nesting, so all of the behaviors that go along with that, uh, courting, singing, chasing predators, incubating eggs, being sneaky and hiding from you when they're going to their nest. There's all these wonderful little mysteries happening in the bird world right now. I should have put a picture in here of this, but I just discovered the other night when it was a torrential rain, I was looking out my window and found a morning dove nesting in my gutter, poor thing. But she survived the torrential downpour. She's incubating one egg. My fingers are crossed for her. <laughs> so there's always wonderful things to discover uh, this time of year related to birds, which makes them a really great focal species for activities to get kids outside and exploring. So I'm going to jump right in and talk to you a little bit about our free downloads. On our website, if you were looking for resources, um, you would go to our activities tab or our lessons and activities tab. And there they are shown by grade band. So whatever grade band you're going to be working with. And under the grade band is the tab for free downloads. We have a variety of downloads that you can check out all the way from 
full science units to more one-off activities, standalone resources. So I'm gonna highlight two of those for you today that are highly adaptable to out of school contexts or just having fun exploring with kids. Um, so the first one I wanna highlight is the Bert Sleuths Explorers Guidebook. This has about six activities designed to explore independently or with guidance. So this book is flexible depending on the age group of the kids that you're working with. It was created in conjunction with the Every Kids in a Park initiative, which was begun by Pre President Obama to ensure that every fourth grader had free access to national lands. So it is written at a fourth grade level. So if you're working with students uh, who are reading at a fourth grade level or higher, they might be able to do this guidebook all on their own. If they are younger or reading at a lower level, they just might need a little bit of guidance. But doing this book in a group is really great when you bring the kids together because there's lots of opportunities for awesome and rich discussions. And I'll share a few of the things that I've used as discussion prompts around this guidebook. As I mentioned, this is available as a free download but if you wanted to have a number of them to hand out to students and don't have access to a printer, we do sell them for about a dollar a copy. So the first activity in the guidebook is a sound map. This is one of my very favorite activities to do with kids. I've done it with everybody from kindergartners on to adults. And I think that it is super fun and everybody gets a little bit of something out of it. So the idea behind a sound map is that you find a place to stand outside or near an open window and you take a piece of paper and draw an X in the middle and the X represents where you are standing. And then you just listen. Sometimes I like to prompt younger kids to close their eyes for a little while. And then once you're tuned into your sense of hearing, you can open your eyes and start drawing, writing, or using symbols to represent the sounds that you hear around you. And the challenge is to do direction and distance too. And what's really wonderful about this activity is it gets you tuned into uh, a new sense that we don't always pay the most attention to, but also really draws your attention to things that you hear all the time, but don't even notice that you're hearing. Some of the favorite things I've had folks report hearing to me have been a chipmunk running across a mulched uh, path, hearing their little feet moving. Or uh, when I was working at a boarding school in Northern Wisconsin, we had a student from Texas experiencing his first winter. And we did, well, his first Northern Wisconsin winter anyway. <laughs> and we did this activity and we were standing outside and it started to snow. And at the end, he with this kind of sense of wonder said, I could hear the snowflakes falling on my jacket. So there's really wonderful things that are drawn out in this. And it also provides an opportunity for your creative students to be creative and draw something, which can be super fun too. Discussion questions I've used around this activity include things like, what did you hear that surprised you? And did you notice anything with your ears that you couldn't see with your eyes, which opens up opportunities to talk about um, how we can use sound to, de to detect animals that we can't see. The guidebook then progresses through some more activities, uh, including just, you know, a classic habitat scavenger hunt. So first it touches on what the components of habitat are, and then encourages you to do a scavenger hunt looking for more specific things like a spider, a rock, a shelter for a bird, um, bird droppings maybe even. So, you know, fun little things like that. It's such a classic activity. It's always so fun to do. Um, and when you do it in conjunction with, you know, learning about the components of a habitat, it opens up opportunities for some fun discussion questions like, what are some habitats that you know? How does the one that we're in now differ from ones that you've observed before? Maybe your yard or your neighborhood. Um, 
and maybe even like do all, are all four components of habitat present if we wanted to fill any gaps what were some things that we could do like put out a bird bath or plant native plants might be some responses you would get from there the guidebook transitions towards learning some key skills for identifying birds it uses the four clues to bird id as kind of a model as well as some components of the Merlin Bird ID app, which is a free app that we'll discuss a little bit later. One of the activities is just about looking for bird groups. And it may be a little bit counterintuitive, but one of the first things that Bird ID experts advise you to look for isn't color, it's actually size and shape. And that's because these clues can help you put a bird into its family group. And once you have it in identified to group, it makes it a whole lot easier to look at the colors and think, okay, which type of hawk did I see? Which type of heron did I see? So let's go ahead and look at some of these silhouettes. I always like to see if we are able to identify any of them. Let's take a look at this one right here that I'm circling with my red pointer. Anyone have an idea what group of bird that might be? Feel free to share your thoughts in the chat window. Yeah, that's right, pigeon or dove. Um, just a friendly reminder to change your messages to um, everyone. Yeah, so we see that it has a little tiny head on a pretty big body, little teeny beak. That's pretty typical of our pigeons or our doves. Also that upright posture can be helpful as well. Let's look at another one together. What about this one down here with the wing spread? What group of birds would you put that in? Hawk, mm -hmm. eagle, yeah. Yeah, so this is some kind of bird of prey, right? A raptor, we see those long, great wings for soaring, the spread tail, absolutely. So just by looking at the shape of a bird, we can begin to make an educated guess about what group it is. And what's really fun about looking at silhouettes and thinking about bird groups is kids will often discover that they know more than they think they do. They all reckon, already recognize the silhouette of a goose or a duck or a gull. And there's all sorts of discussions you can do about thinking about bird groups as well. It's a fun opportunity to share your experiences observing birds, giving kids a chance to tell stories as they love to do. Where have you seen birds in these groups before? What were they doing? And then taking a look at the group of birds and saying, hey, are there any birds in this picture that you don't think we'd see in this habitat? For example, if you're in the middle of a field, you probably won't see a heron or a duck. Great. 
Another free download that I think will be useful to you is our Feathered Friends curricula. It is designed with 10 monthly lessons to have indoor and outdoor components. And in each one, you meet some local birds. So you get a slowly growing group of birds that you know how to identify. Now you don't have to use this as monthly lessons. I've had folks use, you know, pick and pull from this or use it to a day in a summer camp. So it's a highly adaptable uh, curriculum. It's elementary level. And some of the themes include bird diversity, habitat, flight and migration, conservation, and even participating in citizen science. Each lesson comes with uh, educator information, like the big idea, what are we trying to learn here? Like for example, the first one is birds are diverse, but have several defining characteristics such as feathers and beaks. They are uh, common core aligned, excuse me, NGSS aligned. And they all come with a fun home connections activity sheet. So something that the kids can take home uh, with them to do alone, or you could do them as a group to spend more time outside exploring. This what's in a habitat one is a favorite one. I love doing habitat maps with kids, um, thinking about what components of habitat are present, what aren't. The next group of resources that I wanna to touch on are our free uh, book guides for educators. These educator guides are available as a free download on our website. They typically will serve kids in K through five. Uh, I would say we have a little bit more for the K2 audience. You'll find those again under the uh, resource tab for that gray band on our website. And we have just a ton of these. So they are also all standards aligned. So common core standards for uh, math and arts and English language arts, and then uh, science standards through NGSS. I well, just wanted to cover a few of those books for you. So we're gonna take a look at two today. Um, of different levels. So the first one I wanna focus in on is On Bird Hill by Jane Yolen. Uh, Jane Yolen is a pretty famous uh, children's book author and she has a really lyrical style of writing, which you can get a feel for from this excerpt. And on that twig, I saw a nest and in that nest, a bird at rest. Beneath that bird, there was an egg, a little chick, all beak, wing, leg. And it has these really fun, whimsical illustrations that actually provide a really awesome jumping off point for artistic uh, and science activities. So one of my favorite activities that comes from this guidebook is about building a nest. So challenging kids to look at the illustrations in the book and to uh, make observations about the materials used, and then challenge them to build their own nest, collect materials from outside, or if you can't get outside for whatever reason, if it's a rainy day, you can use uh, art materials as well, like pipe cleaners and string. But outside is super fun. You can use all sorts of materials. You can even use up to mud. And then think about how the nests are constructed by birds and what shapes they are in and then challenge the kids to make those shapes. For older kids, I like to include the component of making a nest that's sturdy enough to hold eggs. And in this case, I'll often use rocks to symbolize eggs. So something a little bit with a little bit of weight. For older kids, I also like to challenge them to use, hold their first four fingers together and then use their thumb and make a beak and then try and build a nest using that bird beak shape because that kind of brings home the fact that birds don't have handy dandy thumbs. And so they're not quite as 
uh, dexterous as our hands are, and yet somehow they manage to weave and build these really intricate structures. The next book I want to touch on is A Perfect Day for an Albatross. This is a really gorgeously illustrated book that follows an albatross through their day. And you can get a sense for the writing from this ex excerpt here. I wake before the sun is up. I feel the warm egg beneath me. My neighbors sit on their eggs, sometimes quiet, sometimes clopping their beaks in warning at anyone who comes too close. I am Maale, a lazy albatross, and I have come to this coral and sand island called Midway, where I hatched many years ago. The air is warm and still. The albatrosses around me are preening or dozing or just sitting still. The sun is now rising up above the horizon. It is a new day. So it really does a wonderful job of putting you very vividly into the world of this albatross and you get to see what it's like to find food and what the dances are that they do with their mates. So it provides a super fun opportunity for writing your own stories, for doing some albatross role play outside and practicing albatross dances. But one of the activities that I wanted to bring up has to do with plastics in our ocean. And I'm sorry for the somewhat upsetting nature of these images. The picture on the right is an albatross chick, actually, um, who died because it had so much stomach in its stomach, so much plastic in its stomach. Um, and then on the left is a northern fulmar, which is a bird that for whatever reason seems to survive plastic ingestion much more. Um, and this is a huge problem for our oceans right now. Single use plastics are um, causing a lot of challenges for seabirds. It turns out that as these plastics degrade in seawater, they emit a chemical that smells a lot like the food of a lot of seabirds. So a seabird thinks that they are eating their own food. So it's not just the shape, it's the smell of the thing, which uh, is, hard, is hard for them to parse. So there is an activity in this educator's guide for a perfect day for an albatross called Stash the Trash. And it goes over this challenge of plastic. And has kids think through like, how do my trash end up in the ocean? So there's tie-ins to watershed education here. Then it provides kids with an opportunity to brainstorm ways to help mitigate this issue. Um, so we also, as part of this activity, encourage you to take kids out and do a trash cleanup in a safe way and then weigh that trash to see how much you've collected. And so this can kind of be a, a positive experience, uh, showing that there are things that we can do related to some of these really big world challenges that we have. If you are interested in a similar activity, but work with an older audience, so that, that book really is great through K through five, maybe more like, uh, two through five. But um, this article from our All About, the Bird, All About Birds website, Hardy Seabird is helping to detect plastic pop pollution in the Arctic, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> um, is great for um, middle and high school. Maybe not the whole article, but I, I do think for high school, the article is certainly accessible. It's written in a, in a popular science way, so it's pretty digestible. But it also is accompanied by a 13 minute video, which does a really great job of covering the issues and then talking a little bit about what scientists are trying to do to mitigate that. And it focuses on the Northern Fulmar, which is a species of seabird that, as I mentioned, does eat some plastic, but somehow seems able to survive that plastic consumption which actually provides us with an interesting opportunity to study plastic pollution. 
because these living birds carry a sample of plastic from the ocean from wherever they've been. So you could use the same stash the trash activity for an older audience, but use this video as a jumping off point. Here we go. Um, the next group of resources I wanna share with you are our online resources. So we have tons of resources on our main website for you to explore. Uh, we have tons of free downloads, as I mentioned, but we also have a portion of our website called uh, Science by Themes or Activities by Themes. And I just wanna highlight a couple different things that we have on our website from uh, blogs and quests and some hands-on activities that you can explore. The first set of activities I wanna share with you are science and nature activities for cooped up kids. These were designed at the beginning of the pandemic with families in mind primarily. And then as school started picking up um, with educators in mind as well. So they are, they're actually really online based, but I wanted to share them with you today because there are so many activities that you can pull from them. And, and these cover a really wide range of themes and are for a wide range of grade bands. So each activity has a version for K2, 3, 5, and 6, 8. Um, and they have lots of independent writing prompts, uh, art tie-ins, and hands-on outdoor activities. They have an adult-facing doc, which walks you through what is covered in each slideshow. And um, the kid-facing material is presented through Google Slideshows um, like these. So they are designed to be used with a combination of self-guided and adult-guided. So for K2, they're a little bit more adult-guided, but for 3, 5, and 6, 8, they can be much more um, child just led. And they include lots of super fun hands-on activities. And here are the array of themes that they cover everything from diversity to the whole uh, nesting cycle of birds, bird identification, migration, bird behavior, um, even down to some ways to observe and think like a scientist. So there's lots of different topics here, it covers lots of different uh, areas, and each one is gonna have hands-on activities in it and hands-on outdoor activities in it. So if you are, know you're doing a program or a camp, on a certain theme, there's definitely resources here for you to take a look at. So things like a rainbow hike. So when we talk about bird diversity, we have students look at this gorgeous mural called the Wall of Birds, uh, and then talk about colors in nature and then challenge them to go find all the colors of the rainbow outside. So super fun one, great for all different age groups um, and really just a great open, open your senses activity. Another awesome observation activity, this one's actually from, I believe it is week 10, or excuse me, activity 10, think like a scientist. This is great for maybe even older groups. I've done this with everyone from, uh, gosh, second grade up through adults, and it's a tiny hike. So using a rope or a hula hoop or something to delineate a nice small area, and then your job is to take a mini hike along that area and just observe really, really closely and see what you can find. So there's all sorts of really great activities like this jam-packed in the Cooped Up Kids activities. Along with the Cooped Up Kids activity, we generated quests, and these were designed to be bite-sized challenges along with the themes of the Cooped Up Kids activities, so ways that you could explore further. But even outside of the Cooped Up Kids activities, these quests are available on our website. They are super low material, low setup activities, fun things to do, 
both outside and inside, and there's uh, over 50 of them. So things like just challenging yourself to see five different birds on a walk through your neighborhood, or listening to bird songs and then trying to imitate that, excuse me, trying to imitate them. Searching your yard or campsite for bird food and water requirements. So can you find caterpillars? Can you find berries? What sort of things do birds eat? Uh, fun things like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then of course, encouraging you to kind of use nature journaling as a way to write down the results of all of these fun activities. So it's it's a great idea to have kids keep track of their observations. A nature journal is a really awesome artifact from a camp experience or a program. Um, and it, it can be something that they then pick up and keep using throughout. So for example, I've challenged students to, on a rainbow hike, pick one of the things that they observe and draw it and take notes on where they found all the colors and things. So it can also can be a great way to supplement an activity. We do, I do believe we have a blog about nature journaling, but we also have blogs about apps for outdoor exploration. So if you have kids who are maybe a little hesitant about exploring outside, sometimes apps can actually be a good foot in the door. Um, so I've seen kids that weren't into an outdoor program be given the, the app for recording data or helping identify birds. And all of a sudden they're the center of action and they're drawn into the activity and really participating. So we do have a blog of different apps for exploring birds, plants and animals, uh, weather and soil even. And I believe Susan will share a link to that in the chat window. And I just wanted to take a moment to demonstrate a little bit of what that might look like. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my phone screen with you. So now you should be viewing my phone screen and I'm gonna go ahead and turn on my video as well. And behind me, you should be seeing a bird. So I'm going to try and identify that bird using Merlin. And Merlin is a free bird identification app from the Lab of Ornithology. It's the sapsucker icon on my phone here. So I'm going to go ahead and click that and open it. Now, there are three ways that you can use Merlin. And we'll actually take a look at all three of those. But the first one is for identifying a bird that you see that you aren't familiar with. So I'm going to go ahead and select Start Bird ID. It is going to ask me five questions to help me identify this bird. The first being, where are you? I'm going to go ahead and say current location. When did you see the bird? I'm going to go ahead and say it today. Now, this is where we get into questions about the bird that we are observing. So here's our bird. And you can see, looking at the size of this bird, that is on a twig with lichen. And compared to the lichen, the lichen's pretty big compared to it. So that makes me think this is a quite a small bird. So my size options are sparrow sized or smaller all the way up through goose size or larger. I'm gonna go ahead and select sparrow sized or smaller because it would, based on those lichen, I think it's a pretty tiny bird. And then I'm gonna hit next. And then I can pick up to the three main colors that I saw on the bird. So I'm gonna say black, white, and brown and hit next. And then it's gonna ask me, what was the bird doing? Was it eating at a feeder, swimming or wading, on the ground, in trees or bushes, on a fence or wire, soaring or flying? I'm gonna go ahead and select trees or bushes and then hit identify. Now I can sort through and scroll through the different options it has for me. It's quite a number of birds that fit that 
I'm not seeing one just yet that I think is a perfect match. Oh, 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 wait, okay. So here's one that looks pretty good to me. It has that kind of unstriped belly. So just a plain gray belly. It's got some brown modeling on the wings. It's got brown behind the eye and on the nape of the neck and a black bib on the chin and a little on the chest. We don't see it on this one there, but there's always more pictures so we can flip through. Yeah, so from this picture, I can see that that bib part on the chest isn't always visible. So I'm thinking that this is my bird. But if I weren't sure, oops, lost him. If I weren't sure, I could go hit the I button for more info. I could play sounds. I could look at a range map and read more about it. And then once I was like, yeah, this is my bird, I could hit the, this is my bird option. And that is gonna help Merlin learn how we identify this bird and Merlin continually learns. So every time you hit, this is my bird, you're helping it learn that how to identify it. So I'm not gonna hit that because I didn't actually see that bird today and I don't wanna be any misleading. So I'm just gonna hit back until I see the home button and I'll hit that. The next way that you can use Merlin is by going to the explore birds function. So usually when you start Merlin, it's gonna be sorted by bird packs. So downloading Merlin is actually a two-step process. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop my video. It's actually a two-step process. And the first step is downloading the app. And then when you open up the app, you'll have to download a bird pack for your region. So I have the whole U.S., but you could just do whatever region you're in. So there would be like a Northeast version, a Southwest version, um, and they'll take up a little less space on your computer. There's also lots of international versions as well. And then this is all the birds I have on that pack. So it's like having a regular field guide in your pocket. But what's special about Explore Birds feature is by going up to this menu in the upper right hand corner where it says filter by bird packs, you want to change it to say likely birds. And I'm going to leave it for my area on this day. And I'm gonna make sure that it says most likely. And then when I go back to my list, it is now gonna be in order of most likely birds if I were to step outside my door today and do a bird count. And I actually did a bird count earlier this afternoon and I saw the American Robin, the gray catbird, goldfinch, blue jay, morning dove, and cardinal on a quick little five minute count. So those are all right there in this, this top 10. This also allows you to do some planning for a unit. So say you want kids to learn a few birds that they're likely to see, but your camp or your program isn't until July, you could, or even August, you could change the date to be the date of your program and then go back and you can see how the list changes a little bit. Now we're likely to see a slightly different group of birds. Another great way to use this app is we have a blog about how to create your own bingo card using the first six birds or the most common birds that Merlin say that you'll see, which gives your students an opportunity to incorporate some art. I'm gonna go back to home and show you this last option for uh, using Merlin, which is the photo ID option. So Merlin uses computer visioning to identify birds. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, uh, take a photo. And I have a field guide out. We'll see how Merlin can do with an illustration. This is a bird that I heard in my yard today. So I'll take a picture of that, hit OK. And now I'm going to make sure I've zoomed in until the bird fits inside this frame here. All right, that looks pretty good. Then I will hit Next. And I will tell it to use my current location. 
on today's date and hit identify. And it popped up with Great Crested Flycatcher, which was definitely our bird. So that beautiful lemon yellow belly. So Merlin has a lot of different ways that you can use it. It's a lot harder to get a picture of a bird if all you have is your phone as well. So I don't use that nearly as much, but it is pretty fun. All right, the next app I wanna share with you is called Seek. This is tied to the citizen science project, iNaturalist. So iNaturalist uh, is a biodiversity related citizen science project for all sorts of living things, plants, insects, birds, mammals, fungus, anything. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit Seek. Seek is the identification app associated with iNaturalist. It also uses computer visioning. So what's super fun is you can do it from photographs. So if you have a better camera, you can use those photographs online, or if you have just your, your phone camera, um, and it kind of just scans. So I'm gonna have to unplug my phone. So not actually Sweet William. This one's a little tough because we can see that it's getting to dicots. This is a garden plant. So obviously it's, oh, a peony. Yes, it does fit. It gets us down to genus. These are peonies. And then in other cases, you can keep scanning clover. Yes, that's right. Oh, and now we got to species. We got red clover. So then once you have it identified to species, you can take a picture of it. Um, I'm gonna say keep old photo because I got a better photo of it earlier. <laughs> and then you can read about the species or you can by hitting view species or you can post it to iNaturalist and log it as a sighting there. I'm not gonna do that though because it's a picture of a plant inside which is not useful. All right, you can also use it on different critters which might be more challenging. You can use it on insects. This is a little guy from my garden. You can see it identified him when I zoomed in as a three-lined potato beetle. <laughs> and then you can, again, view the species and view it on iNaturalist and see where it's been reported near you. So in those little green areas there. So. Pretty cool. And then you could report it to iNaturalist and be a logged sighting as well. And then you get all this great information about it, including like seasonally, when is it seen around you? So if you have kids that really enjoy categorizing things, this can be a super effective way to engage them in outdoor exploration. I'm gonna go ahead and stop that screen share and We'll go back to our slides. So those, both of those apps can be really wonderful ways of engaging kids and exploring. It's super fun watching them get excited about being able to name things and uh, run around and, and get excited about how many they can find. Um, sometimes though, certain group of kids, you'll find that like naming things is as far as the interest goes. So you might wanna build up to using the app getting them to explore and describe it and, and think about what they think it is before you use the app to identify it. So as I mentioned, we have a blog, which Susan shared in the chat window, which is um, all about making your own bird bingo card from Merlin. Super fun way to incorporate art as well as some fun ID skills. So if you're interested in participating more in citizen science projects like iNaturalist, uh, there are some great resources for you to get started. This can be an awesome way to engage folks deeply in outside exploration. 
SciStarter.org in particular is a really great site for finding the citizen science project that matches yours and your students' interests. eBird is the largest biodiversity related citizen science project in the world. Um, it's one of the lab's projects and it is tied to Merlin. So Merlin knows what birds are around you because it has this amazing huge database from eBird, the citizen science project. So once you start using Merlin to identify birds, you could take the next step and share those sightings with the eBird Citizen Science Project so you can help scientists know what birds are where and when. We also love to see your student work. So we have in the past had a Bird Sleuth Investigator magazine as a way to share student creative artwork student creative writing, and primarily though, student investigations. However, we think we are probably gonna be sunsetting this magazine. So if you have creative ideas about how to share student work, we'd love to hear from you. And with that, I wanted to provide us with the opportunity for some discussion. I know we're all probably feeling very zoomed out, so um, I'm opening the floor to questions as well as if you have any resources that you love that you want to share, or if there are any challenges that you're finding particularly concerning right now, and if there's any support that you're looking for that we might be able to provide. So please feel free to share your thoughts in the chat window. And while you're doing that, I just want to remind you that you can always keep in touch with us at uh, K12 Lab on Facebook or at K12 underscore lab on Twitter. If you would like a completion letter for one contact hour, you can email us at k12lab at cornell.edu.